Has there ever been a time where you've been in the hot seat? Where, you know, somebody's questioning you and you feel like, you know, you've got the light on you and it's, uh, you know, anybody? Never? 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 When, when's that been? Uh, <laughs> it's like, don't, put, don't raise your hand. <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, was it like a first date where you walked into the house and the dad was there and he had a few questions before he was going to let you uh, go out with his daughter where he had some questions for you like, what are your intentions with my daughter? That's a little intimidating, right? Job interview, maybe. That's always a little intimidating, like a hot seat. And of course, they ask the stupidest questions there. You know, tell me about your weaknesses. Well, I care too much, and I work too hard, and, I, you know, those kind of things. Or your annual review, those are kind of fun, too. Maybe sometimes if you're questioned, if you meet somebody famous, they can ask you some questions, maybe, and that, that can be a little overwhelming or intimidated, or possibly when those blue lights start flashing behind you. That's kind of a hot seat moment in the driver's seat of your car, right? Um, yeah. I can remember um, years, I think it was about 20 years ago now, which is hard to believe, but uh, I used to be a loan officer in a bank, made a loan one time on some cars. Uh, this individual was buying two cars, and uh, the collateral was there, everything looked good, I was loaning less than what the cars were worth, all this kind of stuff. They had great credit, you know, everything was in line. And everything's going along really well until the day the FBI shows up. Yes, and the FBI proceeded to inform me that the two cars that I had made a loan on were stolen. They were part of a chop shop, so here's how this works. So they would buy wrecked vehicles, they would take the VIN plate off those vehicles, they would steal cars and put the VIN from the wrecked vehicle in the new car. And as the FBI guy came to see me, as he brought his binder of over 100 cars that this group had stolen. And he said, let's identify your cars. That was kind of a hot seat moment. But then it got better because it was, if I remember right, it was about a $50,000 loan. Two cars, that's not a big deal, right? You'd think you'd be fine. Well, the debtor decided they didn't know they were stolen. And so they filed bankruptcy to get out from under that debt. So I got to go to one of the bank board meetings where, you know, the CEO and all the big wigs were there, and I get to explain what happened. Um, that was a little intimidating moment, you know. And so, fortunately, they were very gracious. I would had all the good documentation, and fortunately, they said, it's just one of these weird situations. How could you have known, you know? So they were very nice. I kept my job. But it was a little intimidating, you know, a little bit unnerving when you have those moments. But imagine if you would, if the person who's asking you these questions is God himself. Oh, that's exactly right. That's a good response. Oh, you know, and I realize for some people, they may not think this is a big deal. They may think of God like, you know, the Simpsons God right here, you know, just this big cartoony (laughs) character. It's not a big deal, right? But for others, maybe if you've grown up in church or you've read the Bible or read some of the stories in the Bible, This is kind of an intimidating moment, right? I mean, think for just a moment. If God were to ask you right now, why did you do that thing you did yesterday? Anybody getting a little nervous? What about if he looked at you and he says, hey, you remember that thought you had the other day about that person? Let's talk. Tell me about that. What prompted that? Anybody else thinking, um, yeah, I I imagine for me in these moments, I'm scratching my head, I'm going to stumble over myself just a little bit, you know, trying not to say the wrong thing or trying to say something stupid. You know, I can imagine I'd be like, "Uh, well, uh, God, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, well, uh, you know, I can imagine that kind of thing going on. Well, that really, that's, that's kind of where we're going in this series, is that when you begin to look through the Bible, you find some very interesting moments where God asks asks some people some very pointed questions. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this called the hot seat, questions God asks us. And each week we're going to be looking at a story in the Bible to see what is the question that God is curious about. What is he asking? What does he want to know? And then what can we learn from the situation and the scenario that's going on around it? And we're, not, we're going to kind of start back at the beginning, but not at the very beginning, because I feel like we've answered that question before. Because really, one of the first questions God asks is in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have sinned, and he's walking through the garden, and his first question was, where are you? 
And of course, we've talked about that even recently before. But we're going to skip ahead a little bit in the story to Adam and Eve's kids, Cain and Abel, a familiar story to some. And as we were going to, we're going to read, there's an important question. Actually, there's several important questions. But an important question about relationships, about responsibility in those relationships, and maybe a lesson for us that when we face the same question, where is your brother? So let's look. We're going to be at Genesis chapter 4, and I love narrative, so I, this is, I love this story. And it starts off really scandalous because it says, good thing the kids are gone. Adam made love to his wife Eve. And she, uh oh, it's already scandalous. And she became pregnant. You know, good King James Bible said Adam knew his wife. You know, that, that keeps it a little less scandalous, right? And she gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. L later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Here's the beginning of several questions God's going to ask. He said that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Uh-oh, dun-dun-dun. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, like, like every one of my children most of the time. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, look at that retort. Then the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer here on earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod east of Eden. Um, you read this passage, and I don't know about you, but there's a lot of questions here. Not just the ones that God asked, but there's a lot of things. Like, seriously, why did they have to start with saying Adam made love to his wife Eve? They could have just said we had a baby, and we all know where those come from. If you don't, Pastor Amy's here to explain it to you after the service. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's right. <laughs> no, seriously, you can't read this without wondering, at least I did, what, what's God's deal? Anybody thinking that? What's God's deal? I mean, seriously, what was it about the two offerings that made Cain's unacceptable and Abel's acceptable? In fact, if you want to know, if you're wondering that question, you're in good company. Theologians, Old Testament scholars for millennia have been searching for the answer to this question. And the reality is we don't know. I mean, there's some good guesses. I mean, was it one that, 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 you know, Cain brought fruit of the ground and Abel bought sheep? Maybe, but, you know, you get to the Old Testament, grain offerings are acceptable, so it didn't always have to be an animal sacrifice. Did God prefer shepherds to gardeners? I, you know, I don't know. You could say gar God's a gardener because he created the Garden of Eden. That just sounds silly. One commentary I read actually listed five possible explanations for this, and we're not going to look at them because, as another commentary put it, and I thought this was the greatest thing, whatever the cause of Cain's rejection, the writer of this passage is more interested in his response than a digression into inconsequential details. So, we can get all caught up in the details, but it really doesn't matter. Why? It doesn't matter. We can get a clue when we turn to the New Testament because it is talked about in Hebrews chapter 11, where you know you have this faith chapter of the Bible. It's by faith this person did this. And Abel's actually mentioned in Hebrews 11.4 because it says, By faith Abel, 
brought God a better offering. Again, why is it better? We don't know. Uh, than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Maybe the clue here is that it's just the by faith portion. Maybe it's something that we couldn't see about the offering, but more of who the offerer was and what was in their heart. Because there's no question that even though when the offerings are presented, we don't know what's going on, but afterwards, we certainly understand what was going on in Cain, don't we? There was something really wrong. But as I was reading through this, I began, you know, we're not going to get an answer on why the offering was accepted or not. It doesn't matter. But there's some very interesting parallels between what happened in the first three chapters of Genesis and what happens in Genesis 4. Because what we begin to see and understand in Genesis chapter 4 is that sin is not benign, is that there is an ever-increasing impact of sin. You know, you watch Adam and Eve and what they did, and we would say, oh, well, they disobeyed God. That's huge. Yes, but then Cain goes to the next level and just kills somebody. Then we see not only how it moves from impacting our relationship with God, but sin begins to impact our relationship with others, that it, that it makes us jealous and competitive and sees them as the enemy, even to the point of wanting to eliminate them. And then we begin to see something happening in Cain that is even beyond what Adam and Eve did. Is that when Adam and Eve were confronted, yeah, they've tried to shift some blame. You know, everybody's like, oh, Adam's like it's her. Eve's like it's the serpent. But in the end, they acknowledge what they had done. They they do own and take responsibility. But did you see what Cain did? He just, I don't know. I mean, it is like a toddler, right? I mean, it's like, you know, who, who ate the cookies and you got crumbs down your chest? I don't know. Who, who ate the cookie? Where's your brother? I don't know. Just an f- incredible lie. But it's not just a lie. It's an incredible denial of responsibility. That he didn't even see it as his responsibility to do or say anything. Why are you asking me? And then another parallel we see is just right here is that when Adam and Eve sinned, they were pushed outside the garden but they were still near the garden, we assume. But when Cain sinned, it sent him further away from the presence of God. Sin will do that to us. Sin is not benign. It doesn't just sit there. It continues to have an impact. But, you know, as I thought about this passage, what's interesting, as I've said, is there's not just one question. We're focusing in on the where is your brother question, but there were a ton of other questions that God asked before we got there. I mean, you, did you see that? Did you notice that? Before we can even focus on the brother, it's almost as if God is needing us to focus on ourselves. Because look at all these questions. Before, where is your brother? Why are you angry? Well, that doesn't have anything to do with Abel. It has everything to do with Cain. Why is your face downcast? Why are you sad? What's causing you so much sorrow? What's crazy here is in these first two questions that instead of Cain looking at himself, or even the offering he's presenting, he begins to throw himself a pity party. Woe is me, this big, mean God. It's so unfair. And what's crazy in this moment is that God could be like Brent, which praise God he's not, and just be like, suck it up, buttercup. I mean, what is your problem? Just get over yourself and let's move on. But God looks at Cain and he says to Cain, here's what's going on. Here's what you need to pay attention to. Here's how you need to fix this. Do what is right. Do what is right. God lays it out. I mean, as a parent, I can relate to this, telling my children, hey, I see you on this path. Let's shift this and let's go this other direction. And here for Cain is a moment of decision. What is he going to do? Is he going to take a moment of self-reflection and go, you know, why am I angry? Why am I, why do I see my brother as the competition? Why am I so jealous of him? Or maybe why did I not bring the other offering? Why did I, you know, whatever was with the offering, maybe it was there. What could I have done differently to make an offering acceptable? But the Cain never goes there. In fact, Cain goes the other way. He does the unthinkable. And he's given a warning before he does it. Did you see that? God tells him, be careful, be cautious. He says, sin is crouching at your door. And I was, as I was reading this week, it said that in the old Mesopotamian belief 
there was this idea that there would be a demon who lingered around doorways waiting for a victim to cross the threshold. And when you did, the demon who was considered evil would just ambush their victims. And that's kind of the idea here, that it's like, Cain, if you keep taking these steps, you're going to be overtaken. And he does. He kills his brother. And we might want to look back in this moment and say, oh, but they were, they were such savages back then. This surely wasn't a big deal. But it was. Because why would Cain be concerned about being killed himself if it wasn't a big deal? He knew what he had done was a major deal. He knew what he'd done would cause him to be viewed differently by the others in the world. There were no Ten Commandments, but there was clearly a fear of retrib retribution here. But then we get to come to the big question of where is your brother? And it gets right to the question of the problem in Cain's heart, and maybe our problem today, where is your brother? You see, what's fascinating about Cain's response is that he believes that he bears absolutely zero responsibility for what happened. Zero responsibility even for his brother. In fact, in probably one of the most famous lines in the Bible that people that don't even go to church can recite is, am I my brother's keeper? I mean, isn't that an amazing question to ask God? You know what you did. You know where he is. You know what's happened. And yet when God comes and says, hey, where's your brother? And let's be fair, God knew. He's giving Cain the opportunity to own what has happened. And he looks at him, he says, what, am I, it's not, my, not my fault, who am I? And what, as the word keeper there, it's a very interesting word because it was used of a shepherd. And so really what Cain is saying, it's like, am I the shepherd's shepherd? Because his brother was a shepherd. The same word is actually used in Genesis 2 and 3. It's used to describe Adam and Eve's job of taking care of the garden and the angel's job of keeping them out, keeping them out after they'd sinned. That word keeper is a word that denotes responsibility. And what, Je what Cain is doing is like, it's not me. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility, even though he is directly responsible for his brother's death. Responsibility. It's a big word. It's a big one for us. Because I think for many of us, we can't even answer the question of where is my brother because we stumble over the fact of who is my brother. For Cain, it's pretty simple. They were related by birth. We get that. But we look at this and we think, who is my brother? And maybe it's easier for Cain because, yeah, they had the blood relation. But then we move to the New Testament and things get really complicated. Because when we get to the New, New Testament, we find that, you know, Jesus is asked that kind of a question. It's not who is my brother, but who is my neighbor? Because Jesus says we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, Right? And so when asking that question, because we want to make sure we dot the I's and cross the T's and make sure God's pleased with us because we want to do our religious duty, and Jesus just turns it upside down on its head because he talks about a guy on a path, on a road, who's beaten half to death, and the religious walk by, and another religious person walks by, and then this person's enemy walks by. And as I was thinking about that this week, I thought in light of what's happening in the world, let's just put this in a modern context. So you have the president of Ukraine walking along a road, and he's beaten within an inch of his life. And you see Joe Biden walk by and not stop. You see Boris Johnson walk by and not stop. And you see Vladimir Putin walk by and stop and pick him up and tend his wounds and put him on his donkey and take him somewhere and pay for all his care and to the point where he says, I'll come back. You see, for us, that puts it in a little more realism, doesn't it? Because this is enemies. This is the enemy. These are the people that we look at and we say, I don't have any responsibility towards you. And Jesus says, hold on. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. In fact, there's a story in Matthew, I think it's chapter 12, and where Jesus is teaching. And somebody comes in and they're like, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are out here. They want to talk to you. And Jesus says, well, who are my mother? Who is my brothers? Except those that do the will of my father. 
he begins to break down the barriers of what we see, the barriers that we want to erect and say, I am not responsible for you. And Jesus looks and says, not so fast. In fact, I would say that when we want to look at what's happening to others and kind of turn a blind eye, we better be careful because that's the spirit of Cain. That's the spirit of not my responsibility. We have to be willing to lean into who is my brother? Who can we identify? And what we have to see is that it can be anybody around us. It is our family, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your moms, your dads. It is the people around you in this room. It is the people around you that you work with. It's your neighbors. And yes, it's even your enemies. And once we identify who, which could be just about everyone, then we have to move into action. Where are they? Where is your brother? And you know what where is a question of? It's a question of location. It's a question of proximity. Are we close to them? Are we near them? Or at least are we close enough to even know what their needs are? That's the challenge. Because I think for so many of us, we look and we see and we're like, oh, there is a need, but I don't want to get close enough to truly understand what it is or how to engage it. But you know, the question that God asks, what we have said many times already, it is a question of responsibility towards one another. Should we mind our own business? We love that in our country, don't we? I mean, I, I'm the king of this. I don't want to get involved. You know, oh my goodness, Carrie and I were in a store the other day. And the aisle over, we hear something taking place, and it was apparent to a child. And we're kind of, you know, you, have you been in that situation? What do you do? What do you do? Do you step in? Do you not? Should we mind our own business? See, we, we would think that the principle of total self-responsibility and pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps would be something we get from the Bible, but it's really not. <laughs> the story of Cain and Abel has to make us stop and pause for a moment and ask the question, what is my responsibility to the people around me, my friends, family, neighbors, even enemies, those who don't look like me, those who don't talk like me, those who don't vote like me, even our responsibility to those in Ukraine right now and Russia. We need to acknowledge that there are probably several reasons that we don't get involved, that we sit back and say, not my responsibility. It's like that show I've talked about before, What Would You Do? It makes me uncomfortable. You see, we see something bad happening, and we might get involved if cameras are involved, but what do we do if they're not? So here's a question for you. You can respond back on this one. What do you think are some reasons we might have that for not stepping in and taking responsibility? What say? It'll cost us. It'll cost us. Inconvenient. Inconvenient. Fear. Fear. Mm, yep, misunderstanding the situation being wrong. Takes a little bit of humility to come into these situations, doesn't it? Too busy. Too busy. Oh, there's the American culture right there. I made a list just for fun. It was quite lengthy. Look at this next slide. Isolation. We like to be by ourselves. Individualism. Tribalism, because it's not my tribe, so I don't have to care. Not seeing them as people. Yep, we take the image of God out of people. Competition. We can't help people if we see them as competition. We're jealous of them. Can't celebrate their wins because it impacts us, evidently. Our insecurity. Self-preservation. Indifference. Self-centeredness. Distance. All those things can be reasons why we just kind of sit back. Now, here's another, <laughs> here's another good question. How do you think these excuses are? How good are they? when we see others in need? How do we think God responds when we turn a blind eye to the needs of those around us? You see, we can't distance ourselves from the responsibility that we have. And please don't misunderstand me. Sometimes some of you take this too far. You need healthy boundaries. You are not responsible for everybody. And if that is you, we'll preach that message a different day. <laughs> Set healthy boundaries, okay? People are responsible, but we also have a responsibility to lean in. 
But I do think many of us need to reevaluate our involvement and engagement. We can't just go do our job and come home and close our doors and just isolate ourselves. We have a responsibility to others. And God is telling us that exists. We don't get away from that just because we think we can. We don't get to turn that blind eye. We are connected. They are made in the image of God. And if we were put in their shoes, what would we want done for us? Isn't that the ultimate question? What would we want done for us? How would we want others to respond? So the story is just crazy to me because it just turns very violent very quickly. And I maybe, maybe we don't understand that. But I do want us to be cautious about what a disregard for brother can lead to. No, I'm not saying if you turn a blind eye, somebody's going to go out and kill somebody today. But we do need to be careful. Because even Jesus addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said you don't have to physically kill somebody for you to murder them in your heart. Our anger, our hatred, our apathy all come into play because our attitude is just as important as our actions or our inaction. We don't have to be malicious to not care. Think about that. You can do nothing and be ambivalent but still have hatred towards them and, and it, it demonstrate hatred. And I believe our indifference and inaction does equal hate. Think about what the Bible calls us to. What does the Bible call us to? We love the one another passages. You guys familiar with those in the New Testament? I picked out just some of the things, the one another's. Be at peace with one another. Love one another. Honor one another. Stop judging one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Have concern for one another. Serve. Carry burdens. Forgive. Be kind and compassionate to. Bear with. Encourage. Build up. Pray for. And that is just a partial list of what we are called to. Serving means stepping in. Loving and caring means going for, forward. One book I read this week was talking about this question. And the author talked about how this question, where is my brother, is a question of invitation. It's a question of invitation for us to recognize our responsibility toward our neighbors, our enemies, and even the world. And listen to what the author talked about. Because he talked about how Cain sidestepped the invitation. He said this. He said, when God asked about his brother's whereabouts, he, Cain had a wonderful opportunity to model what it meant to be a responsible member of God's human family. He could have said to God, Lord, I killed my brother. I've done a terrible thing. I've sinned against you and your family. Please forgive me. I will try to make amends in whatever way I can. Imagine, if you can, the creative and life-giving consequences that would have flowed throughout the world from that kind of response. But is that the response we had from Cain? No. His primary concern... Did you catch it? What's going to happen to me? Even after he killed his brother, even after he denied all responsibility, his main concern was still, how will this impact me? I wonder if sometimes we don't struggle a little bit with this today. We see things happening, and instead of being willing to step in, we think, well, how is this going to inconvenience me? Is this really my responsibility? They should take care of themselves. If it doesn't impact me, do we really care? With what happens with the poor and marginalized, if it's not on our nice suburban doorstep where I can't see it, is it even real? I'll tell you it is. If it doesn't impact my job or my stock portfolio or the price of gas, let me, let me get back to my Netflix and sporting event or whatever distraction keeps me from the unpleasant side of realizing not everyone is as blessed as I've been and I am not my brother's keeper. We live that way sometimes, though, don't we? And I don't want you to go out of here feeling guilt today. What I want you to go out of here is with an attitude that says, where is my brother? The question that God asked millennia ago is, I think, a question that is still as relevant to us today. And I say again, I'm not trying to pour guilt on you because I don't think guilt is a great motivator. What I want us to see is, what about those around you? those that are made in the image of God, those that aren't as blessed as we are, those that are struggling, those that are dealing with real conflict and difficulty and mental health and addiction and abuse and whatever else in their lives. 
we have to realize sitting here in a West Des Moines church in a beautiful building in, you know, right here, right now in our nice clothes with our nice cars, we've been blessed. And we are our brother's keeper. And so this week, here's what I'd like you to do. Ask that same question. Where is your brother? Where is my brother? And here's a challenge for you, uh, just a simple spiritual practice to put into place this week. Intercessory prayer. What I want you to do practically is to just pray. And it's a form of spiritual warfare. We practice this by holding particular people, especially those in physical pain or mental anguish, in the healing presence of the risen Christ. We practice by speaking against the evil forces of self-interest and greed and racism wherever they operate, and we command them to leave. And we practice this by persistently asking God to bring the kingdom near in the places of injustice and oppression and darkness. And we practice by silently listening to the human groans in our midst and to the groaning of the Holy Spirit within our lives and articulating them before the Holy One. Let's practice some intercessory prayer. And right now you may say, I don't know who you're talking about. Great. Then you know what your intercessory prayer is right away? God, reveal to me who is my brother. That's where it starts. Who is my brother? And as we approach this question, let's begin where Cain should have begun. A little self-evaluation. It's painful. It's ugly. None of us like it. But let's make sure we deal with the sin that's in us. Maybe that self-centeredness, tribalism, whatever it might be, that sin that may be crouching at the door so that we can truly love and care for our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and friends, and yes, even our enemies and the world. Let's pray. God.